we present we present to you, Mr. Sanford Biggers. Let's give a little oh, bit of the background. <laughs> you usually give the background before I fucking go off. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll give give a little bit of background really quickly to just uh, to just draw you into this uh, on Twitter breaking nine one one account. Uh, this is probably the first that most people saw of this uh, this uh, piece of art. A new 25-foot-tall statue unveiled in New York City, the Rockefeller Center, to honor African culture. And it is a, uh, a very, very large, very imposing statue by an artist called Sanford Biggers. Uh, it's called the Oracle. Oh, my God. And, and, and even, like the, peop- the litany of people that responded to it like uh yeah and there was like, a, there was a basic, basically a twitter storm caused by this uh, yeah. in the quote tweets like, uh, as always basically first people look at this and they think this is one of the most racist things uh, we've ever seen yeah and i mean i do understand people for thinking that at first obviously there's no context really given up most people's first experience of this statue was seeing this basically this breaking 911 uh, video of the unveiling of the statue um People's reaction to this on Twitter was completely kind of disconnected from the overall context of the yeah. artist himself and the artist oeuvre and even the point of this kind of exhibition in general. And all you really got was this kind of shotgunning of this, you know, uh, what, what you would maybe maybe describe as a kind of a, a Sambo-esque uh, caricature of, a, yeah. uh, you know, an African mask uh, on top of this uh, statue, which is basically, you've got the, body there which looks like a classical statue and we'll go into this a bit later about the real context of this but this led me down a path um, of deciding to look into this Biggers fellow so Sanford Biggers born 1970 in Los Angeles is a Harlem based interdisciplinary artist who works in film video installation sculpture music and performance as his biggest art frequently references African-American ethnography, hip-hop music, Buddhism, African spirituality, Indo-European Vodun, I don't know what that is, jazz, Afrofuturism, urban culture, and icons from Americana. Um, He Mm. claims to place no hierarchy on chronology, references, or media, and his work has been characterized by meditation and improvisation. He says that his themes are meant to broaden and complicate our read on American history. He also uses syncretism to highlight the interconnectedness of seemingly disparate cultural practices. In order to make the viewer an active an active element, uh, Biggers often turns his sculptures into performances, uh, and he plays piano and does various uh, music projects as well. So, obviously, this is this is an established artist, Sanford Biggers, and I did watch some interviews with him uh, in order to kind of get more background on him. Seems like a very eloquent guy, very intelligent guy. I thought he was gay at first, but he's not. He, he is married to um, a lady. Maybe it's because he's so very stylish man. Um, and obviously the, the first thing you're kind of, you know, taken with is this is a very racially charged work. This is all tremendously... Very much so. It, the it, very, 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 yeah. yeah it, it, More, is, I mean, on the level of Kara... I mean, maybe without yeah. the sexuality involved of Kara Walker. Yeah. And Kara, is, Kara Walker obviously is an immediate parallel that I drew to this as well, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting in the interview I watched with him. He says uh, he mentions himself as being maybe part of a future uh, second Harlem Renaissance. So I, I think he sees, um, yeah, may, maybe himself as uh, a vanguard of some kind of black cultural renaissance, which I, I am personally kind of somewhat doubtful of. Uh, not because of uh, you know black people's creativity or anything, but simply because of his his character and his own milieu. And uh, yeah. we'll get into you know the, the power He's behind. He's very much uh, an implant. Like Yes. Yeah, yeah, he's very he's very much like unfortunately um I don't want to like police anyone's like identity or whatever. But when it comes to the Harlem Renaissance from 1910, the interwar period, so mm. 1910 to 1930s, um a lot of the illustrations, a lot of the style, a lot of the music, a lot of the um the more like northern regions of jazz and and blues and and then later rhythm uh that stuff was very organic. It came from a lot of newly settled slave lineages that traveled to the North. And a lot of them came from Canada. A lot of the people don't know this, but a lot of those artists, they came up here to Canada mm-hmm. too. Um, so the Harlem Renaissance was very much a unique thing. And Biggers said he traveled there to basically be in keeping with like 
because at one point Harlem was the driving like heartbeat of African American culture mm. in America. So you're saying you're saying he, he there's a, there's a desire he had to travel there to, in search of authenticity. I think is what what we're saying here. It's like if I were yeah, it's like if I were to go to back to I don't know. I probably would have a better connection going back to Brazil or like Italy or somewhere and be like, I'm going to paint exactly like Titian or whatever. Right. So it's, it's the same. It, 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 to me, it comes off as Biggers trying to have this very detached and he, you know, someone who's traveled in a lot of academic circles like him. Well, he was a professor very... at Columbia university. As I'm going to mention. Oh, well, so exactly. He was yeah. actually literally a professor um, and uh, yeah. undergrad and all that. So a lot of what happens is a lot of academics in in in, uh, in art schools, and especially with uh, prestigious universities in the Ivy League, what they do is that they will um, slowly but surely, I don't know if this is experience with everyone, but slowly but surely they'll start to like peel off being a quote unquote artist and they will dabble in a lot of different things to further their repertoire with whatever they're studying. Mm. And so Biggers, he is like, to me, it just comes off as... Um, the difference between like a kid growing up in Harlem and handing out a mixtape and like someone coming from LA from a huge pedigree in academia. Yeah, that's a, yeah. In the art and, world. It, and it and is like, somewhat like, Carl, yeah. you can again draw parallels to Kara Walker in that regard as well. Oh, Kara Walker's yeah. father being a prominent, uh, is he, is he a, pro- a professor as well? I believe. Or? I believe so. Yes. Yeah. He's actually quite a well reputable professor. So <laughs> yeah. it was sort of like the, he's, she's doing the family business sort of thing. So not so. to psychologize too much of these people, but there yeah, is, no, exactly. there, there's a, yeah, yeah. there is a search for authenticity there. There's a search, yeah. uh, there's an, because these people are essentially outsiders in a way. They're outsiders in their own culture. And exactly. they they want to plumb these particularly racial depths and they want to go to places that, you know, challenge people and upset the, uh, you know, supposedly upset American culture history because I think that they're searching for that authenticity and they want to be respected by, you know, their own people. But in doing this, I think that they end up being, they they end up actually alienating a lot of the real, you know, uh, as we, you know, the the real uh, um, G's or whatever you want to call it, you know. Is is the average black person that lives that goes to Rockefeller Center after their shift or whatever, are they going to look at this and be yeah. like, wow, that <laughs> totally represents me. Yeah. And but this is what we'll, is, we will get into later is, is you know, yeah. obviously there's there's a huge disconnect throughout running throughout all of this between but, the intended audience of, of Biggers' work um, and maybe, you know, what you'd call, you know, black culture, real, real black culture I, and organic, organic uh, black creativity. Exactly. And the thing is, I want to caution against, um, like, placing a premium on authenticity. I know that's a very cheap and easy point, but I do feel it's valid. But at the same time, I do understand the criticism because there were um, people who actually struggled in in the art world as black people Mm. that were heavily critiquing people like Kara Walker. And the thing is, I don't want to place a premium on the quote unquote cult of authenticity to quote Adorno because it, it is an easy point to make, but at the same time, it's kind of true. It's like, it's one of those things that it's inevitably going to be true that you are basically an implant and you are an alien to these people that vaguely have like common roots with you, but not really. Um, and the thing is, it's it's cynical to, to say that, but it's, it is it is true because to me, the intended audience uh, isn't other black people, put it that way. But, but just, just to go into some of Bigger's work quickly here. So you've got the the famous uh, BAM series where he would basically uh, make these little wax sculptures and then um, yeah. he uh, wax and wood sculptures and then he would shoot them uh, and then cast the resulting uh, music and he would name disfigures. them after every yeah. yeah and he would cast them he would cast the disfigured uh, sculpture in bronze uh, make them very big actually you know they look reasonably small there but you actually see if there's a scale with somebody that he's actually very large. Um, in different calibers would inflict different damage. Yeah, he would blow different yeah. limbs off them and stuff. And then he would name them, uh, obviously, in a, in a somewhat ghoulish way. He would, he would name them after um, uh, certain you know, BLM martyrs, I suppose you'd call them, these people. Michael, who, Michael Brown and, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 St. Floyd. Obviously, he um, would not name them after, uh, you know, black people who maybe, you know, died in, in other ways, only ones who were culturally important to a certain political yes. agenda. <laughs> Yeah, so in terms of the other stuff big is is made, you know, you've got the quilts. He's and very eclectic. He's very eclectic. Yeah, I give him that. He's definitely very eclectic. I like that, you know, there is that kind of art school thing where you haven't, you know, you, you've got to experiment with all these different things. You've got to yeah. put, your fi- put your finger in many different pies. 
There's the music stuff, which you know, not that interesting really. But he does do kind of this. Um, it's basic Afrofuturist. Yeah, he's Afrofuturist like, radio funk, funk jazz, fusion. Yeah, yeah progressive yeah. Radiohead jazz, whatever. But interesting thing about that is that there are those kind of uh, funny, uh, you know, aesthetic elements of Afrofuturism. Yeah, but the, it, they perform in these weird masks, which obviously look very racialized. You know, deliberately, deliberately so. They're meant yeah. to maybe make. Uh, affluent white audiences feel a little bit uncomfortable like it's some kind of a you know a, a weird um caricature that they've just stepped into harlem and that there's you know there's all these um all these poor blacks like kind of jiving and shucking and jiving around them or whatever you know and yeah. there's also there's also other things here in in biggers's work there's um we'll get to the chimeras in a minute but there's also this funny lotus design which basically is probably to me this is kind of one of his most crass kind of designs where it's basically you've got the this layout of a slave ship with all these bodies yeah. packed in very tightly. Um, and then it's arranged in a petals that he calls a Buddhist uh, lotus, basically. And I believe this piece is called a lotus. And these are printed very big uh, in kind of embossed, yeah. embossed printing. And I think that this is just kind of like, you know, this is a very lazy art school kind of work. He, he does like old tapestry art which is again another... the quilts are the most interesting to, to me the quilts yeah. are the kind of the coolest thing i think they are the most interesting and the little story behind them is apparently people who were the descendants of slaves uh gave yeah. him uh, things that were basically family heirlooms or something or artifacts that they had been handed down from you know yeah. before the 20th century these early 20th century quilts and stuff uh, and he would do, uh, you know, his traditional kind of chopped and screwed uh, remix on these quilts, make them into different kind of things. Uh, there's, you know, turn them into. So it, sometimes it kind of looks, you know, if you if you didn't know the context again behind these things, you think, oh, that's kind of like, uh, you know, some kind of hipster interior yeah. de decor kind of thing. Um, it's very much like Jacob. Yeah, that's the name, Jacob Lawrence or uh, Tompkins. It's very much like that Harlem Renaissance type of like caricature of like taking modernism and applying it to the quote unquote black bodies in the same like sort of abstraction of the human form that you find in like um largely european high modernist portraiture so mm -hmm. it's the same kind of vibe to it yeah yeah so but the main thrust of his work and i think the main thing that he is now kind of focused on is these uh statues and they they are called uh chimeras uh, mm -hmm. And the Oracle statue, this statue that was unveiled, a very, very large statue, 25 feet tall, that is actually part of this series of works, the Chimeras. And just to talk about that quickly, so the Oracle itself, this is a bronze statue, 25 feet tall, weighs 15,000 pounds. You know, this is, oh. a, this is a tremendous um, piece of engineering here. And the concept behind these Chimera series that Biggers did is you've got a uh, a very simple kind of mashup concept. You've got the head from a uh, African tribal mask or uh, something like that, or a statue, and you've got that fused onto uh, the body of these uh, traditional, often very well known European uh, classical statues, basically. And some of them yeah. are Roman statues, some of them are Greek statues. Some of them aren't really, uh, to my mind, some of them are not even really the authentic ones. But no, the, no, they're like a. They're like a Greek or Italian restaurant version. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is something I think is, again, kind of interesting. But this is all in keeping with Biggers' own uh, philosophy, I suppose, on art. You know, he doesn't really um, necessarily care for where he takes things from. He doesn't really care about the, the, the no. so-called uh, respectfulness for, you know, whether this is real or whether this is, you know, an Italian restaurant version of something. Uh, if you read Jameson's book, which is foundational text, um, postmodernism, logic of late capitalism. This is the basic sort of abandonment or disregard or dis act of disregarding purposefully by postmodern aesthetics um, of context and, and rootedness mm. of particular traditions. Because now, especially in America, especially in American culture, in the American culture industry, there is like pillaging, There's pilfering, yeah, pil pillaging, pilfering, pilfering of. Yeah, exactly. Of different um, traditions, left and right, and, and center, and but these, it's really. I don't even think at this point it's really even pillaging of traditions. I, I think that this stuff all is just kind of. I, I don't re want to reference um, Paul Cleese, Angel of History again, but this is all basically the garbage heap of history. All this 
all this yeah, detritus. Yeah, the all just, it's a massive garbage heap of detritus that's all been completely deracinated, all just stripped from its context, and is now and, and just so a big old heap. Them. And this is the in, unfortunately the internet has enabled this. It's enabled some, someone like Sanford Biggers is enabled him to kind of go and scroll gently through, uh, you know, and take. Oh, I'll take this. I'll take that. I'll take this bit. You know. I mean, we all do it. You do mm, it. I yeah, do it. We all do it. Yeah. yeah. It's, we're a product of our time. It's it's real. Like literally, I see the statue. And I could just imagine him like doing a Google search of images to like African art, Hellenistic <laughs> yeah. art. It's like that's <laughs> it's like I can I mean, imagine to, him to be a little kind very of, visible. To be a little yeah. kind of him. I mean, I'm sure he does do, you know, he he, he doesn't oh, just pull these things out of his ass. There, there's an iterative there is an iterative process to all this sort of stuff. There's I mean, a narrative as well. There's a narrativization of it, yeah. which we'll get in, you know. It's it's the distinction between postmodernity and hypermodernity. This is Large the art of hyper modernity in the sense that it is a co collage of images that is aware in terms of like the back end politics of what's being expressed, but in terms of actually the creation of the work of art, it's pretty much just standard procedure at this point that mm. you're going to like do this like postmodern eclecticism. So it's not like a conscious breaking of norms. It is it is the norm. No, that is yeah, that, that is a very so, very good point actually. I think because. Yeah. As much as he wants this art to be about, um, you know, a particular cultural niche, I suppose it is again. It, it inevitably ends up as the art of globalism again. Is he? Oh, daddy, it's, this is neoliberal kitsch. Yeah, this it, is, it, it is in a way neoliberal kitsch. Yeah, well, particularly yeah. because I mean, of the context it's, it's, and it's the, more advanced in terms of being ingratiated in the the sort of the different trends of the art world that's going on right now. But don't get me wrong. This is very much the flavor of neoliberal kitsch. But this is, a ma this is a man who I think that in terms of neoliberal kitsch, this is a man who's got, you know, the credentials to come off as about as authentic as you can be in that Possibly, milieu. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And that this is why, to go on here, uh, this is why the funding came from who it did. So you've got the Rockefeller connection now. You've got oh, yes. Yvonne Force Villarreal. I don't know if you pronounce that word. Yeah, Yvonne Villarreal, and she is a famous uh, arts uh, funding lady, I suppose, patron. or a patron, exactly. Yeah. Um, but not necessarily a patron. But she 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 also uh, ensures that art is made. She actually funds the making of the art itself, rather yeah. than just the buying yeah. of the art. Um, and she uh, created this thing called the Art Production Fund. She was backed by Lawrence S. Rockefeller. So Lawrence S. Rockefeller oh, is the, oh, there you go. the person here yeah, who is yeah. who's the money man. Um, and Biggers himself has actually had a 10-year relationship with the Art Production Fund, apparently, um, mm. of which four of those years were spent uh are basically considering the uh, practicalities and the, the you know the signing off on this project of this massive statue. So this has not been a quick decision. This has been something that's obviously had a lot of you know a lot of thought put behind it. People, yes. lo lots of back and forth going on. I mean, that's a serious thing. This you know this object being made. I think it's even more serious than the sugar baby sphinx or anything like that. Because oh, this, this is you know this is bronze. To have this a thing. piece, to have a piece of art even just temporarily displayed in the Rockefeller Center is the equivalent of like winning the Turner Prize in Britain. Yeah, so you're, so, way, you're saying this, this is like, to, to give context, I suppose, to people who are not, you know, uh, necessarily American listeners or whatever, this right. is a huge, huge pedigree. This is probably the biggest pedigree you can have in terms of, you know, it's, your it's just public as, display it's, yeah, of art. In terms of public display of art, it's just as big as being in like the ben Venice Biennale, in be winning like or being a shortlister in the Turner Prize mm. or being displayed in MoMA as a contemporary artist or like being someone who is like at the absolute pinnacle mover and shaker of the art world. So in, in terms of biggers, you know, being asked to put this piece of work in the Rockefeller Center, you you gotta think like so what's Biggers his own uh, you know thoughts about this? And obviously there's a quote here, he really jumped at the opportunity. He said it was like a light bulb popped up over my head. When Raymond Hood was, and he's the Art uh, Art Deco yeah. uh, famous architect who designed these uh, collection of buildings in the Rockefeller Center. Yes, when, and when, Art Deco, as we know, is the like basically the aesthetics of like high American capitalism. Yes, that's modernism. right. Yeah. High, high capitalism, basically. So, oh, but but, but Vouch likes it. <laughs> he does. Sorry, yeah. that was the dunk tweet I did a while ago. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So Biggest sees this piece here as a companion piece to these other statues in the Rockefeller Center, you know, and so he's, yes. he's all too happy to kind of have his piece ensconced in this uh, in this, this temple is the of global capitalism. Like, 
like global capitalism delivering like the new woke man to us. Yeah. Sorry, new woke zir to us. Um, <laughs> the, to, <laughs> and because I, it, he, need, he sees himself as part, this, this is almost like a pantheon kind of thing. And we'll, we'll get into it. It is a, very a much. It's these, a pantheon. Um, yeah, yeah. Obviously, Rivera's famous mural of the uh, the man at the crossroads was chiseled off and was actually replaced with uh, this Zeus relief sculpture uh, at yeah. 30 Rockefeller Plaza, where he's kind of uh, in a very, very stylized Art Deco fashion, um, yes. basically with a Masonic compass in hand, uh, measuring the, and dividing the world an ordered is, universe, an ordered structured uh, capitalist uh, friendly like universe, it, and that comes from that comes from when Descartes had the vision of the angel, where an angel appeared to Descartes when he was part of the Habsburg army, and Terence McKenna loves this story. Loved the story, by the way. So this is kind of a direct reference. Uh, to this ordered universe that the angel did speak of. Uh, yes. This is a, a geometer, a systematizer, a god who is someone who is a mathematician, basically. Urizen. Urizen, Urizen that's right. Yeah. And th this is a character in Blake's mythology. Uh, obviously, that he created himself, his yes. self-created mythology. But he is meant to be kind of an, an analog or a, a parallel to uh, part of the god of the Torah, the Old, the Old Testament god. Yes. Uh, but he's, he's the Old Testament god as kind of filtered through the lens of... Uh, Enlightenment philosophy, I suppose, or as, as a yeah. ma basically Masonic uh, philosophy. Um, exactly. Sh and shout out to our good friend Logo Dad. Yes, that's right. He um, he he did yeah. have he did have a tweet about um and, and this image really, itself. Th this uh, exactly. And, and he said, uh, "Atheist, this is supposedly in scare quotes because there's no such thing as a real yes. atheist. <laughs> atheist, this is your god, and it's Arizen. Um No, but he he has a great point, um, Logo, in that Americana or the American century." is largely driven by the spirit of Urizen, mm. largely driven by the materialist, um, post-Enlightenment rationalized um, bastardization of Christianity to explore um, the world in such a way. And in a way, like the Rockefeller Center is at the heart of it, like the heart of like the American culture industry that has like poisoned the world through globalization mm. with capitalist realism I mean, or whatever you, you want to call it. And Modernity I, I, is, yeah. I always try and look, you know, maybe look through these people's eyes, you know, try and, uh, yeah, know, dare yeah. I say, empathize with the philosophy behind what these people, obviously, you know, most people would say, oh, these people it's are pure, murder, it's pure it's evil. Monstrous, it's, it's and monstrous, anti-human. It's monstrous, anti-human. But it's obviously, there's, yeah, it's, no, it's, pure, yeah. it's pure Gnosticism. But obviously, you know, this was created with intent, you know, that this is a clear, direct parallel. You know, you can even see the hand on the Zeus, uh, the Zeus figure really is, directly yeah. emulating that particular picture of Urzen. So it feels to me like these architects and these designers like uh, Raymond Hood or whatever who commissioned these things, there's a conscious parallel here. This is, this is not just a weird, you know, just... It feels, it feels like these people have actually read Blake and they maybe just took and ran with some of the concepts. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously Blake is a somewhat misunderstood kind of figure you know i think well he was going he was going he was very much like a, a romantic like like rousseauian in mm. some ways he was rebelling against that like well he saw man I, liberal can, I suppose blake yeah. blake saw the spirit of man himself as god you know and not necessarily yes, having yeah. to uh you know submit to some kind of outside tyrannical force whereas in you know inside you really is the the whole of the law the, whole of divinity. The, the gospel yeah but then he would also say that like what the what the people were doing with the enlightenment that was like a misinterpret a misinterpretation mm. Be because they were hyper inner divinity I suppose because they were hyper focusing on one of these four what we call the four uh, zoas these four yeah. kind of aspects of man and therefore of God you have these four different aspects some of which are very rational some of which are very irrational and some of which are you know uh, different sort of tendencies. Um, which is interesting. That I don't know if there's any parallels, particularly to the the process uh, Church of the Final Judgment, which is a a cool cult from the um, the late sixties, <laughs> where they they had, I believe, yeah. it was it was Satan, uh, Satan, Jehovah, uh, Christ, and Lucifer. It was four aspects of the the human soul there. Um, but that, be that as it may, yeah, that, that all comes from Young too, because yeah. in the end to Job, he uh, talked about how there was also a Satan within uh, Christ, like there's an evil aspect of God because he's a complete God. So that made him like, that made him quite like unpopular by Christian readers, especially Catholic so, readers and uh, equated him with Gnosticism. And there was Gnostic like so, Stephen I mean, Holt later and like, yeah, yeah. The, the traditional Catholic, I suppose, 
or, or Christian point on all this would be this is all highly Gnostic. You know, this is all very yes. much um, we are uh, making ourselves basically into into gods with this. And you've also got this uh, this Atlas figure as well here. In um, this is by Lee Laurie, the uh, the big figure of Atlas holding up the uh, the globe, which almost looks like a kind of I thought this almost looked like kind of a um, a navigating system of a ship or something. One of, or one of these. Um, Almost like an observatory kind of thing. Your compasses, it's a hollow. Yeah, sure. yeah, it's a hollow. It's a hollow globe he's holding up. Um, and interestingly, around this is this another statue that's done in an Art Deco style, very very stylized Art Deco style. Um, and obviously, it's got you know there's there's echoes of futurism in there. You know, Italian futurism obviously yes. informed Art Deco in a lot of ways, which I think you yes, know, man will like the sort of. Self overcoming will to power. We will overcome through through speed and yeah. power and stream, you know, streamlined technology. Beautiful, beautiful technology will power us into the future and yes. endless, endless horizon. Um, and we're going to kill a bunch of people. Yeah. No, I'm <laughs> well, if, if a bunch it. of people, if a bunch of people die, then a bunch know, of people die. Were... <laughs> some may die so that others may live. <laughs> <Yeah>. So <laughs> um, very much like a and I suppose an Anne Rand. You know, there is obviously an Anne Rand <laughs> yeah. Atlas Shrug yeah. connection here. Ale Alice shrugging is like taking off the burden of like, I don't know <laughs> the burden of like communism or, or some like fellow care of man and like becoming this like total, uh, total moral autist, egoist. autistic, basically yeah, autistic, moral, egoistic. moral egoist. Yeah. yeah. That's going to like sternerate his way to the top, which um, I think is interesting, but now you mention it, actually, maybe that is part of why Vouch actually does like um, art deco is because there oh, is that kind of autistic drive to like self, you know, um, yeah pure self sort of actualization because communism and capitalism it's all about the affirmation of the self at the end of the day they have like the mirror epistemologies in in ontology like they have a mirror ontology about the the view of the human self in the world and you know and i know other people have talked about this take but it's true i mean that's why vouch loves art deco despite it being like the deck the most decadent cat like i mean i'd like art deco too um, well, like Art, Deco is, Art Deco is beautiful in terms of its its stylization because but it, it definitely owes is a lot like to, in Americana, hmm. you know. It's it, Art Deco to me is like a kind of it's a pleasant medium uh, in its best forms. It's a good medium between yeah. Art Nouveau, which became in its later period, it did become a bit too Itch. fairy, yeah, a bit too fay and a bit too kind of effete. And then the Americans took Art Deco and became this like monstrous, like brutish, like driving force of industrialization just taking over the world yes, and like that's right. do as thou wilt do as the the weak do as thou must yeah. and it, I mean, it, it, it is interesting that this 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 atlas and this zeus they are portrayed as uh, and prometheus which we'll get onto in a second they are yeah. they are portrayed prometheus maybe less so as figures of great strength and uh, potential and for beauty. violence and beauty as well yeah but also but mainly i'm, I'm you know particularly when you look at this atlas figure there you know there's very powerful musculature you know he's very very stylish. rippling with the golden physique <laughs> rippling with the physique. ancient world physique in terms of the you know this other statue that you've got alongside you have prometheus here and that's probably one of the most famous i believe it is the, the most well known of the statues that is in the plaza of uh, rockefeller center paul yeah, manship uh, paul, paul manship's prometheus and the inscription oh. behind this Prometheus statue says, Prometheus, teacher in every art, brought the fire that hath proved to mortals a mean to mighty ends. So in, in the terms of the Rockefeller Center, this is a context of we essentially built all of this. We, we are the ones who took this fire and we used this fire. We built we built all this wonderful capitalism, <laughs> basically, that you see around you, that you are actually surrounded with. You know, this is a yeah. monument to our, um, you know, defiance, essentially, of the of the gods. Yes, in our yeah, our defiance of the old order, and our vision and our capacity to self overcome. Yeah, self overcome. Like absolutely, that that's exactly exactly right. So, I mean, in in terms of Biggers's statues place among these, uh, you know, these Art Deco statues that speak of futurism, you know, individualistic sort of will to power, and uh, you know, um, ruthless capitalism, basically. I suppose it does fit in very well, actually. I think I think Biggers is actually right that it yeah. does, his statue does fit in quite beautifully among all these statues. And so, I mean, <laughs> in in terms of like you know, there's, there's always this question when it comes up, this sort of thing on Twitter, where do you particularly ascribe like you know an active malevolence to this or to this whole this whole project, this whole kind of you know thing in general? I think that 
it, it's very yeah it's it's become appropriated by ghouls that actually like the money people that are doing this i think they are consciously aware of it but i think that in in terms of how these pieces come about especially nowadays it's sort of like just commenting upon discourses in the, that were taken up in the art world mm. that were present. And I, I think that bigger is, well, he's a professor. So he may know like the, he definitely knows the cultural milieu of uh, what this piece is representing. But I do feel that in some ways it's pretty much like as organic as you can get in terms of these are the things that are very like in vogue nowadays in the art world. This is like the, that's that, that's the point I was trying. That, that's the that's the thing I'm trying to get at. Is like, do you yeah. do you think that Biggers understands that he is completely, you know, that why is he the darling of the establishment? Like, like, why does 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 he relish this? Does he think that this is, you know, um, a, a means? To, is this a means to an end to him? Maybe. I think on a personal, like, narcissistic level, there's probably something to that. But at the end of the day, it's just um, taking trends that were already within the art world, like mm. that, for a very long time, and creating something that is contributing to that discourse. Yeah. But through that, it still is a recognition because guaranteed, someone probably floated this idea to him, or he had it himself. That like, wow, this is going to piss off the racists. You know what I mean? Like this is well, going I to think I'll, I'll, yeah. you know, it's yeah. I think there is there is a tremendous sort of self awareness to a lot of it, really. Where yeah, it, yeah. but it's the power. Well, especially Kara Walker's work. Yeah, oh, especially. Kara Walker yeah. aspect, yeah, particularly. But yeah. I, to me, it's like it's just the weird, the weird kind of power games where it's all it's all involved. Where a lot of the people you see these takes on Twitter as well, the more astute people in the quote tweets, they do say they're laughing at us. They're actually, you know, this yeah. is a sort of a. Um, you know, basically Emperor's blowing a raspberry. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, the emperor, no, the emperor didn't know that he was naked. That's the thing. He, he genuinely yeah, didn't know. Yeah. Like, this is kind of a defiance almost. They're saying, yeah, we're going to put this here. We're going to cast a 25 foot thing in bronze. You know, we don't give a damn. We're going to just, you know, cause, do they think that people, are they so ensconced in a bowl? Because I obviously, you know, you know Lev, whatever, he's from New York. Um, there is an art bubble that people live in where they can yeah. live this entirely kind of self-referential life that's very disconnected. Oh, incredibly like, self-referential. Is Biggers yeah. reading the quote tweets on this? You know, is, is he looking at this and thinking, wow, I, don't I, even I really think trolled these people epically. Someone... This is publicly, you know, this, this art book is meant to be looked at by the public. But for example, there were, there's a video that I um, put in the notes where there is a lady uh, who basically goes round. The art and, hoe um, that goes around. Yeah, I've seen spewer videos. Yeah. I suppose you'd call her an affluent white liberal female or whatever. Um, <laughs> the, who goes, the off, yeah. The awful... She went to the uh, Frieza art fair and it's like, now we have this thing and it looks really cool. And yeah. it's like they have that tone of voice. I'm not saying she's a bad person. No, but not just, at all. She, but but yeah, in it's... terms of the audience, because we we obviously exist in a bubble of sorts as well. You know, we have oh, our own oh, artistic, yeah, definitely. Come on. we have our own culture. Damn. But people on Twitter, people of a reactionary bent, people who are making commentary of this, is not are not the only people who are making commentary on this. A lot of people hate this this piece. But in terms of people who like this piece, you know, there was this woman who did this uh, sort of, sort of walk around the Rockefeller Center, a uh, little vlog, basically, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Going around, she's got the app and everything, and she can see all the virtual reality, uh, augmented reality aspects. The, the augmented reality inserts to each piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love, I lo that's like, to me, that's like, it, it's, it's like the NFT thing. It's like the art world, like trying to be relevant still by like, be, like wedding itself to Silicon Valley. Um, In this video with this woman, I was kind of like, thinking like this this seems very very vacuous very empty kind of going around there but i suppose yeah. when you're there and you have the app and everything and he's and you... commenting on different identities coming together and it's yeah like really and she, cool. it was almost like it's she like was reading doing... off the card yeah. in, the, in the thing it yeah. was almost like she was doing pr for biggers himself just by sort of seeing his but exhibition way, which is kind of the, the point of her exhibition it's all just a pr kind of um you know it's reading the cycle. cue cards on the art pieces themselves and it's like you like taking like really deep concepts that these artworks are trying to convey and like breaking them down in like a PR speak of like, you see this bigger's piece is like the commenting of the different identities in America and how we have different voices and, tr and cultural choices that come that are unified in this collective uh, experience, but also how black people affirm their own identity in the American, in the American context with other cultures. And it's like, 
it's very much like a PR pamphlet type of voice. And this is entirely enti- this yeah. is entirely like a sanitized discourse. This is this is a discourse. Very much is like, no, because this BLM has become be... a sanitized discourse. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But this art would I mean I mean that's a that's a that's a very like basic point, but it's in the in the, in the current art world, especially in New York, the BLM things like the hot new like for the pat not hot new, like the past ten years. Um, it's become like the mainstay mm. of the art world. Yeah. But I, I suppose Big is himself, you know, he a lot of his work, I suppose, does predate uh, BLM as we know it. Um, yes, yes. But I think he's seen it as a very kind of opportunistic thing where this is a cultural where moment where I finally, now. yeah, he's he, exactly, he's a vanguardist, avant-garde, um, who now finally has his time to shine. He gets his, he gets his literal monument, you know, his literal, uh, you know, for all of his hard graft in, uh, you know, being there in this cultural moment he he, he truly sees himself yeah. as part of a, a renaissance too but it, the thing is that this time it's a renaissance that's entirely backed by the establishment it's, it's a renaissance that's backed by global finance yeah. capital yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so i mean literally kind like, of, literally it's a bit of a victory i suppose in that way where it, it's kind of like well you've got your big hideous monument in the rockefeller center now i mean now what <laughs> you're gonna where the only way is is down i suppose from there um but then, I mean, the guy, the the guys, kind of, you know, I suppose you can be so lauded because you know there's so many publications that probably write just glowing reviews about all this kind of thing. Yeah, it's a self reinforcing kind of cycle where he a lot doesn't of these have people... to ever, you know, it doesn't have to ever examine that maybe his, you know, the reason why his art is being pushed on people in this way. And apart from a, like a few examples of people that like have like the license to drift from the norm. Like in terms of our critics, um, obviously, like me, you, Adam Lehrer, other people, um, Dean Kissick, uh, Donald Cuspid, I would say is probably pretty not dissident, but like he like strays from the norm. Apart from like a few examples, it really is like these are publications, these are critics that will like literally like suck off more mainstream pol- like uh, publications, like the New York, the New Yorker, the New York Times, to like really um, like hit home the fact that. The, the vast majority of quote unquote art that is in the popular discourse comes from like, like people in the quote unquote animation industry. Like those are the people that are commenting the most that people like have viral tweets over and stuff like those people, not like professional art world people, professional art pe- world people in the car, the contemporary art world. They're like mostly ensconced within academia. Mm. And so these critics, they, they're all professors or they're like adjacent to professors. The art teachers are all professors. The students, half of them are professors. Yeah, yeah. So, so I suppose what, what you're saying yeah. is you couldn't really have this kind of without the uh, academia industrial complex almost. Of yes. Art. No, the, art, the contemporary art world is in, in New York especially is very much a product of acad- American academia, yes. And in London too as well. In mm. London, it's no different. So... Um, it's very much a product of this bubble in academia and cultural studies and lit, lit studies, MFA programs. And so you really need critics that are like kissing cousins with professors who are also critics, moonlighting, <laughs> uh, like people like Jerry Saltz to come in and oh, yes, like, a, cleanse yeah. the sins. We didn't of, see, uh, did, I didn't actually see what Jerry Saltz's epic uh, response was. I wonder what was. his, ep- I have yeah, to yeah. look this up, we his epic up. take. Yeah, we have to do this. Be- but yeah, so basically there's this incestuous relationship I would say it's not even incestuous to the point that um, it's like a mainstay of like what the art world is now. It's basically just an extension of academia. I mean, that could be my own like um, cynical reading of it as an art outsider. But from people that I know that are in these circles in New York, they say the same thing, like apart from um, people that, like are on the margins or people who have been afforded um, these spaces of critique. Hmm. It very much is like you, the only way to make it now is if you go through an MFA program, more or less, <laughs> and you know people. To, just to jump off from uh, this particular, the the big, bigger statue, just to come back here to these uh, smaller Chimera statues as well, because there's a few yeah. references that I think people might find interesting in terms of the ones he's actually taken um, and also the reference for the uh, the big oracle statue itself. So the first chimera here you've got at the top, you've actually got this is um, is based on a famous statue, the Crouching Venus, by mm. I don't know how to say this, uh, Doi Dalsa, Doi Dalsa, Doi Dalsa. I don't know who that is exactly. 
But Boy, that's, yeah. Famous, famous statue of this crouching Venus. Very, very famous, particularly even... Even the leg or the foot of this has been uh, used as a, uh, a a teaching aid for students when they do like a bog plate um, a copy. Um, oh wow! And I believe there is a there is a, a this may be in the British Museum. I can't remember exactly. It was it's certainly um, I feel like this is in the British Museum, but I may be wrong. Um, and then you've got the uh, the second one here with this uh, this this leaning figure here is obviously based on the uh, Farinese Hercules. He's actually titled this uh, statue uh, as Canigula, uh, which oh, is wow. meant to be some kind of pun on the word Caligula, but it's kind of nonsensical because this isn't really anything. I mean, this isn't really anything to do with Caligula. Um, I don't think this this Hercules was made under Caligula. I'm pretty sure it was made under Caracalla, which was another mm. uh, Roman emperor, and it was in the baths. I think this was found in the baths of Caracalla, and this is a famous uh, Hercules, which is based on a Greek, is a Roman statue that's based on um, a Greek, Greek original. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but well, probably, probably one of the most famous um, ancient statues ever, and obviously a physique icon for uh, many a, a gym bro. Many a, vi- a Baptist vitalist. Many a vitalist, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and the one at the bottom there you've got, which I can actually see this. Uh, this is only available in the virtual reality um, uh, AR thing. But there is oh, another wow. There is another Chimera one, which is based on uh, Moses here. And it's interesting to look at this quickly. You can see that Big is, is actually merged. Like the, the skull, or the, not the skull, the mask is actually completely uh, clipping almost through uh, Moses' arm, so it's almost as if he has these. I, I assume that he, uh, what he'd done in terms of the creative process for this is, he's got a three D model of this Moses, um, which I've I've actually Googled for this. I've found that you can actually just find this; it's freely available um, uh, on Sketchfab or something. You've got this uh, famous Michelangelo Moses, obviously with the horns uh, in the. I believe that's the tomb of a certain pope. I think he, he sculpted that on. Yeah, and he's simply fused the um, in a 3d program uh, whatever he's fused this um a scan of an african mask uh with this maybe this has been edited as well because it's got three faces this one i presume maybe that's that that probably comes from the many many faces of shiva that's probably another like eclectic i don't know i'm not sure he's even thought that hard about that but yeah maybe probably not i don't know maybe maybe you're right actually that they're no clipping into wokeness (laughs) (laughs) But like you look at these statues side by side and it's like it's like my guy, it's like it's like that woman that like takes like classic um like classic like art history paintings from the Western canon, like the Delacroix uh Woman of Liberty and like paints it with like black oh, yeah, people. Yeah, that's it's right. like, no, it is it, it's it kinda is, like it's basic part of that genre. I mean, we gotta yeah. say at this at this point that this is its own genre of something. Yeah. Um, and that it's very like low level, like stick it to the white racist. Um, Mark uh, Zucker faces sister. What's her name? Uh, Zuckerberg, the one that wrote about how like studying classics. Oh, yes, will make that's you right. Racist. Yes, of yeah. Course. yeah, yeah. It's like that, like studying the classics will turn you into like an evil Nazi white nationalist. <laughs> um, so it's it's very, li- it's very much like this. Uh, he he ha ha look at this you evil white people racist yeah, i'm but, taking your art form and making it into woke people black people it's like woo because it's, it's because very the, much yeah, that yeah, yeah. The, the implication obviously in this um you like venus you like how is, yeah, her yeah. vivacious buttocks you like that well i'm gonna put an african mask on it and you're gonna like it yeah. because if you don't like this and you're racist even though if, if you know if i don't know if you were to like uh which I mean, the Europeans kind of did. Like the first statues of the Buddha were made by Greek people. But um, <laughs> um, you know, I don't want to make a super basic Paul just Watson point. But well, it's true. It's it's like this very much like he he ha ha appropriation of the the art of like evil racist white people. Yeah, well, that it's like now it's what, becoming wokeified. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. That there is. I mean, to me at least, like giving this a very like charitable view. Obviously, not trying to you know. Because I don't really care what Biggers does to these statues. Well, these statues no, get, they get, re- I mean, if you they get remixed it, all the time. I mean, that they get put in. You know, you put the moustache on the Mona Lisa. You do all sorts of things like this. Because I mean, I do Japanese woodblock printing. Come on. In terms of what Biggers actually himself has to say about this, is you know, Biggers says he felt empowered to remix classical sculpture, in part because of our contemporary understanding of these forms is already so flawed, um, which is something <laughs> that I suppose you could. Yes! 
Yeah, that's already quite a, load, quite a loaded statement, obviously. But the, the classical <laughs> European, the classical European statues that we know today as sparkling white marbles. Emphasis ah! on the white. Oh no! Emphasis no! on the white. There. <laughs> Not they, the white marble. The sparkling white marbles were once brightly painted, uh, while African no. masks were originally beaded, pigmented, and adorned. So you have a whitewashed version of the European objects and a blackwashed oh. version of the African objects, Biggers said. Cutting, editing, oh, and pasting, chopping and screwing has been happening the entire time. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. That's his... That's his uh, so just, like, totally deny the traditions that they both come from. Just, yeah, like, yeah, totally exactly. yeah, that, like, bury the past that the milieu and the spirit and the highly contextualized cultural conditions from which it arose. <laughs> and again, this is Heidegger. This is the work of art that has been so thoroughly disconnected from its world that it might as well just be in a museum. Mm. I mean, this is... It's art, yeah, just that's like, so interesting. That's, it's art yeah. that's made for museums, which is, which is interesting that yeah. neither of these original things was ever made for a museum which i think is that is a great exact great point they didn't even formulate it as a work of art it's i mean maybe later on with david and all that but like they didn't have the same like they they thought that it was a um artistic representation of the spirit of that particular community in that particular epoch mm. that they were carrying on in time their civilization, both in Africa. Well, the there's African a religious, you know, there's a religious context Greece. to all these, I suppose. In, in terms yeah. of the, you know, the the crouching Venus, but obviously, it's, that's it's a Roman god. Literally, just like an Amer, yeah, it's like an American woke person, just like totally denying that religious context, saying, "Oh, it's all about the materiality." And again, this <laughs> is like the theme of the contemporary world du jour. It's just looking at the materiality of things, mm. literally the materials that you're making art with, and but you it's are ignoring. That he's, he's not only denying the religious or the, the spiritual aspect of the European art and saying we yeah. whitewash that. He's also, also de the denying art. the African art as well, which is, <laughs> you know, which is so just... hoteps. Look, I'm putting my hands together. Hoteps and white nationalists shaking each other's hands. <laughs> this is fucking terrible. <laughs> so, <laughs> which I've written down. We're here. brothers. We are still brothers. Yeah. I, I've written down here that he is again, racialized and brought race politics into both African and European art. L yeah, literal how funny. Blackness, an American, literal blackness, literal whiteness. An Amer you mean to tell me an American <laughs> who's being funded by hypercapitalists yeah. that they're racializing traditional contexts of both European, Indo European, and African art in different yeah. tribal settings? Wow. Oh, oh, <laughs> sorry, I'm having too much fun with no, this. That's almost, yeah, yeah. That, it really is almost as if he's fitting directly into that that role perfectly, you know. And that, that's maybe <laughs> yeah. why the Rockefellers are so so keen to fund him, you might say. Oh, exactly. Um, I mean, make of that what you will, right? So But oh. to come back to the religious context of this, again, there is a, a religious undertone because uh, as you said earlier, you know, there's no such thing as atheism really, but there is a religious yes. undertone. And obviously you don't want to give the tired James Lindsay take a uh, wokeness is a religion, whatever. I, I don't think that I don't think that this man's religion is wokeness. I don't think he views this. No. As, I don't think this man really has a coherent but, religion in a sense. But he he definitely does worship a certain uh, I suppose self mythology. He 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 certainly yes. seems to love yes. mythologizing himself and mythologizing himself into a pantheon almost of. And I, I've written this down here as well. This is again comes down to celebrity worship, and this is a, a cult of yes. celebrity. The cult, the cult of the of, artist as celebrity. Yes, now. that's yeah. exactly it. And to to double up on that celebrity aspect of it, he did have an augmented reality aspect to the Oracle statue, where apparently you could uh, scan this QR code uh, that is near the statue, and then you get to ask us the statue about your future and. You will give you will be given a vague <laughs> mystical answer. Apparently, you'll be given a vague mystical answer by voiced by a celebrity, and I'm sure Biggers has very gleefully gotten. You know, he's rung up all of his you know cool friends in the uh, the rap world and uh, the jazz world. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder if actors uh, uh, and things. Yeah, Morgan Freeman's gonna. He's God, so he's gonna tell you your future. That's. I think Morgan I, Freeman I didn't has know more, more self-respect than to uh, than to voice uh, one of Stanford. Yeah, it'll, it'll probably. But I know be he's like, got some cool. Uh, yeah. He's he's got. I'm sure he's got some cool hip hop people and some. You know. Yeah, I guess no, Stormzy will tell you. Um, your future's looking bright, mate. Your future's, <laughs> like, your future's looking bleak, bro. Your future's looking <laughs> looking far gone. Yeah. And but, it'll be like fucking. It'll be like um. 
It'll, it'll be like uh, Kendrick Lamar. Yeah, yeah. I, the, the, uh, he's pretty woke, so yeah, he'll that, like probably sort of, say, yeah. he's like, listen, your future is going to be, um, <laughs> and it'll like have like the GANs, like uh, AI technology to scan like what race you are. So like depending on what race you are, it'll like give you a different future. Like if yeah. you're a white woman, they'll tell you that you're going to become uh the herald of the new age of like interbred P- by POCs that will <laughs> like raise you up kind of like that one scene where Daenerys is like the queen of the black people in that one uh, Game of Thrones scene. So it gives like, you it gives you your yeah. your your um it gives you be careful what you wish for kind of fantasy I suppose. <laughs> Imagine if it actually like, did. That would that would be very funny if it actually did give you things that came true. That would actually make yeah. it a worthwhile piece the, of art. The, I think. Thing, the thing that's crazy about this is that it very much is like an auto theistic, like self mythologizing of the genius artist, which is largely a product of like the post Enlightenment period, the Romantics, the genius mm. artist that's going to change the world with the through the work of art. It's very much like decontextualized, and again, America. Um, was sort of like waiting in the wings in history to actually like to to go ahead and actualize that vision of like the central planner, the artist, the architect, and that's such a wonderful the celebrity point. Card <laughs> that it's going to like project into the future. The celebrity now the artist not just becomes the progenitor of the future, but now the artist becomes a celebrity because like it, it's it's like in a way how like hip hop culture was like or music in general like pop music was like basically taken in by the bosom of Hollywood. And now there's no difference. It's like now the artist genius celebritard is going to project their vision into the future. But what I find interesting about the Oracle aspect of like this AI generated like pap of like this, I don't know, stock, like a genie in a bottle, um, the, the sort of like, uh, tell your fortune, um, eight balls mm. you know but in a, in a like me- media by like silicon valley like ai technology using celebrities which is again highly ironic yeah yeah it's all it's all not in a wink kind of oh super, super it's, irony because in a way it's, it's a super not in a wink to the total like gutting and the total like cheapening through culture industry schlock and through like celebrityism of those ancient traditions of the oracle mm. it's like this yes, that's, a, that's exactly what ironic. i was going to say exactly what i was going to say he, he was he's basically saying yeah. here that oh you know all that eleusinian mystery sort of stuff all that stuff where you had you know, cult, cults and, of dionysus yeah. and stuff where everyone get off their fucking tits on you know uh, mushroom gas Ergot, or, Ergot yeah, Ergot yeah. or mushroom. that was yeah. all just that was all just something that was you know vague mystical and kind of you know it's, it's a it's a silly little thing basically but now it's like a fun little like you go down in an in one well, Newark in particular, you go down to Coney Island and they have the genie uh, that you put a coin in the genie machine and tells you your fortune. And it's like, <laughs> and I'm sure that he he's probably somewhat aware of this because you know, obviously he is a guy who you know takes from Americana as well as he as we said yes. earlier. You know, I'm sure he understands the that land there is of this fortune and aspect. dreams. Yeah, there's this kitschy aspect to it where you know the kitsch Americana of the land of dreamers. Yeah. There was a point where I thought maybe he, and I want to be a bit, bit kinder to this fellow and think, well, maybe he is trying to bring back something of a kind of a, you know, a re-enchantment to, uh, you know, a fun kind of aspect where you, you sort of almost re-enchant, yeah. re-enchant the world. But then I saw this woman actually going through the exhibition and doing, you know, the, the augmented reality stuff. And I, I realized it is just another kind of bauble that sort of dangled in front of affluent, rich yes. liberals. Um, because now they have NFTs and they have uh cryptocurrency futures so it's like now they're going to use that and be like wow even the art that i consume is also hip and trendy in silicon valley and it's like it, you, i, I you get what you're get, saying you do get the feeling well, that, he's, that he's trying to almost as well cash in on the whole like oh i bought an ipad that has a picture of a beeple um thing yeah. for, for fifty thousand dollars whereas the david hawk needs your that we could do a whole one on that oh, yeah, too yeah. but uh no, but it's it's like very much um, it's a good point that you brought up. It's an excellent point about how the, in a way it's like Silicon Valley, like and you see this with like these new age cult retreats, like Silicon Valley millionaires paying like Elaine de Bottom to like go in the 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 school of life house to like meditate yeah because they they, they want to like get a, like a package deal of like mysticism they want they want to buy and, but it's a like a experience. gamified yeah it's, it's, it's like a, a super reified and gamified version of it <laughs> yeah. but the thing is like it's 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 a myth it's in a way it's trying to like 
re-enchant this mythos of the Oracle, but it's like mediated through contemporary politics on one end mm. and on like that Silicon Valley, mater- like spiritual materialism of like super efficiency bobbles that technology can bring us because technology has exhausted its vision of the future. Yes. And now right. it's, it's just, just a recycle. It's a recycled sort of yeah. zombie, zombie machinery, which is kind of giving you, Oh, a new, it, a new dopamine uh, attraction. Which isn't it's really that much different to you know because we had we had all this sort of virtual reality stuff in in the nineties anyway and no one. Cared. That's what I was gonna say. In the nineties, it's literally like that art gallery in New York. I think it was MoMA that had the Osmos machine that Terence McKenna talked about, where they would plug you in and you get to like interact with like the virtual environments. It's literally the same shit over and over yeah. again. But it never ended yeah. up getting used for any because it was unfortunately detached. It was detached from any kind of authentic authentic purpose of art. Really, it was it was all just a gimmick really in the end um, it's pretty yeah it's just a purely a gimmick i yeah, mean something something to me something like um what's that horrible demonic woman um <laughs> Marina yeah, yeah it's, all, it's almost like the abramovic experience is kind of a lot more real a demon because, pig goblin in a red dress <laughs> dancing in front of you but to, to me i thought to, to me like oh she she did the whole virtual reality thing where she kind of steps in but she was but, dancing in the red dress yeah, yeah but before that when she did the whole thing where you sit in a room with her and you have a mystical experience because she looks at you yeah, yeah that to me is far more real and far more there's something far oh, more yeah. kind of Obviously, yeah. you want to say it's a cult, it's demons, whatever. Well, she was actually like putting herself at risk too, because like you like go up and like rape her or kill yeah, her, yeah, and she yeah, would yeah. have to stay there. And yeah, pe- people were having you know mental breakdowns, all sorts of things. Yeah, but this is sort of I, art, I, which I, is I would so safe. Her. She's a pre- I, she's probably a good cuddler. I don't <laughs> yeah, know. Yeah. She looks pretty good for her age. I got never mind. Well, no, so, this isn't the geo fetish hour. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> It's, it's it's like a re-enchantment that's like perpetually frustrated by all of these like culture industry forces and wokeness or whatever you want to call it. it. It's perpetually frustrating because I, I think you're right that there is he does want there is maybe at the heart of it maybe underneath all the layers of cynicism all the layers of like you know ironic nod and a wink there is like he wants to again going back to this idea where this man is kind of searching for authenticity. Yeah, is, there's he wants to get to something you know that is essentially like you know getting shame and down to like some kind of shamanistic fucking uh, level where you're you know experiencing something you know just that, that is like beyond, beyond purely shaman, the physical yeah, yeah exactly and yeah. it's a folk you know, it's kind of like a there's a folk religious aspect to it however but it, unfortunately yes. to me to me it's just and it's too wrapped up in its own cleverness like it doesn't get <laughs> you're very like, clever i think like as much as a lot of like our circles or the people that we know of like that talk about um like how like the fundamental deracination of the like this experience of like indo-european identity they're like shafting like the noble white man faustian white man to like you know find their true purpose and identity Mm. i think like at the same time even though they're given like so much currency in both the american like british american anglo canadian like media space I think that even like black people in America, they probably do feel this as well in terms of like them being fundamentally cut off from their ancestral lineages and them experiencing this form of like total deracination and uprooting in in a way that like a lot of uh, white people are starting to feel that now. I mean, they did invent their own yes, like I, well, indigenous they, cultures in America. Yeah, yeah, that they are absolutely a vanguard for that sort of thing. I think someone like Hotep Sophia, she would she'd be the first to admit that you know, yeah. black people they did have to pretty much create from whole cloth, uh, you know, a lot of the time yes. their own. Uh, and a lot of times they had to appropriate from older African traditions mm. along well, with. Well, that's that's the aspect um, of a, of a yeah, creole a creole language or creole sort of spirituality where you take yeah. bits from you know your colonized as well yeah exactly yeah like for example the american black churches is like a good example of that and i mean yeah. there is a richness to that culture absolutely I would, I would never dispute that that is you know oh definitely yeah not a but real no, modern black people are even being disconnected from those traditions yes that's right so. something that i thought crossed my mind is is big as here is he fetishizing african traditional art here because you see a lot of again african people uh commenting on this in a very loud, <laughs> real African people, in a very <laughs> real loud, Afri- yeah. I know that's like a racialized from, uh, literally sorry, Africa, but... you know, because uh, unfortunately, yeah. you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't take a genius to realize that most people in Africa do not really look too fondly down upon uh, Afri- uh, fr- upon uh, American black people. I think that there's a ba- that they have a very bad reputation uh, oh, yes. among African yeah. uh, African people, uh, you know, and 
in, in you know in more extreme circles, obviously Tariq Nasheed's not he's not a, a person who speaks for all um, uh, African American people, but in some ways he he is. Another, he should though. He, he is. Should. No, no, in I'm some kidding, ways he is a kind of a vanguard. He also expresses a massive distrust and a you know uh, a racism essentially against African people, and he he thinks that they're trying to usurp um, what he calls you know foundational Black Americans. Um, well, well, that's really culture. crazy because. Like a, a lot of even like Hotep discourse, like a lot of that comes from Nation of Islam, like a lot of like discourse of African-Americans trying to reconnect with much more older ancestral roots in mm. the continent. And so it's like a lot of like, for example, the Nation of Islam thing, like a lot of the, they, they had like their own mythologies around it. And Malcolm X had his own ideas about his own lineage and like taking like Muslimified African names and so forth, and it's like, but this is this is all to in order to throw off essentially what they see as a, a colonization of their bodies and of their spirituality. I suppose someone like Franz Franz Fanon, as it would say, that you got to as, as a colonized subject, you have to create a ways to uh, escape from that paradigm or through. Yes, it, it also involves taking parts of your colonizer's culture and turning them against him. I suppose. Yeah, counter discourse. Yeah, yeah, turning against them. Yeah, w- which in a way is like you could say like wokeness and liberalism. Uh, yeah, but but that's the, that's the weird thing about it is you know, okay. So you have um, Sanford Biggers. He he constantly mentions well. I noticed African diaspora. He talks about African yeah. diaspora, but I don't think a lot of black people see themselves African diaspora really at all. No, in America. Oh, not in America. I, I, no, yeah. and I think no. that a lot of the time that. If they went to Africa, they would probably find themselves, you know, having not so great a time of it, honestly. <laughs> well, there are some people like usually like kids of rich people that are make up like American expats in Africa, that they've escaped like the evil racist colonialist America and they've gone back to their roots and they mostly live like around Lagos in mm, Nigeria. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and they mostly like have all of the like. They work for like corporations, so they have like management positions and all that stuff. So, yeah, there you go. But I mean, would would you say that um, the African, you know, pe- pe- African people's disgust to this work? Do you think that's just a natural sort of visceral reaction? Then, do you think that's something that they they see this and they see something that's alien and completely out yes. of touch and disconnected with, um, and and actually gives a bad name and a stain upon you know their own culture? Well, their culture is highly localized even in terms of just like facial physiognomy mm, and yes, how yes. their their various tribal art forms express their own self identity yeah. this is like to them this is like cartoonish like racist american like caricatures of black people like in yeah. blackface i saw i saw that mentioned a lot i saw that mentioned a lot it it creates a kind of a um, a panacea, I suppose, of, of every every African culture kind of homogenized into this complete yeah, monster, which in the end like doesn't total Africa any, <laughs> any respect. You know, yeah, exactly. I mean, Africa is, is is absolutely vast and so you know, dare I say, diverse tribes and cultures do they have? Like, you know what I mean? Like, how many thousands of tribes and cultures and peoples there are in these different countries, which were like largely chopped up yeah, yeah. by like Britain and France and other. But yeah, I, I would so. say that I would say that Biggers himself, I don't think he has a shred of respect for. I mean, he only respects Africa in what it can do for him and his yeah, own yeah. ethno narcissism, <laughs> his own ethno narcissistic <laughs> kind of thing. In that sense, yeah. Oh my god! Like even just like talking about how, like the masks were like black faced by time because the jewelry like fell off like yeah. like real people in africa don't think about this stuff like they well, look at those statues like that's my <laughs> you know that's my culture Damn. Well, i've got a picture <laughs> up here of the of actual african masks that are on a wall and they are all yeah. very very beautifully painted and ornamented and things you know and obviously yeah we, you do get this kind of british museum context where you've got like you know some african mask that's been you know uh, stripped of all its fineries no longer you it, it is a, it is a museum piece um, yeah but yeah. To me, like as I said before, Biggers' his work it is it's doomed to be in in the same way as I mentioned Kyra Walker's piece. It's like this does not have uh, you know a future really as something that no. you, can, you can really look at. Upon. It, it exists purely of a kind of a, a cultural moment of wokeness. Now it couldn't really have come it, into it being. It wants without... to have a future because mm. it's it's situated in a a pantheon of artworks in the Rockefeller Center that. Um, 
was created and designed to carry Promethean man into the future. Yes, so it definitely right. has those aspirations, but whether it's going to live up to it the way that the, the Diego Rivera mural does, I mean, well, I suppose that, yeah, the Diego Rivera mural was, was unceremoniously scraped off the wall. Um, well, yeah. And even, well, I mean, I mean, communism failed. So that's <laughs> yeah, well, there, you <laughs> there you go, I suppose. But Here I mean, you go. yeah, it's, I hope it was worth it. I hope that that sweet, 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 delicious, Frida Kahlo pussy was worth it. Yeah, it <laughs> I'm sure it was. It was probably. I mean, all. I, apparently, she was great. But <laughs> I. I don't. I, I see these people like they. They come at me, um, and I understand why. But they're like, oh my god, Frida Kahlo is a ghoul. How can you like this? But Frida. Frida is. I mean, the problem is like she is the queen of the art hose now. But yeah. like. Frida is actually a good artist. I feel that Fre Fre was to me, capable. like, yeah, I think she was a great artist. Honestly, I think she was a very, yeah. very self-reflective, very sensitive, and very kind of. You know, she she went through a lot she of pain. She was capable to express the uniquely, the the sort of unique machinations of female suffering yes. uh, in yeah, ways no, that, that other artists. That, yeah. that is actually be really beautifully put, in my opinion. The unique machinations yeah. of female suffering is perfect. But yeah. obviously, in this, in the and same her way personal that, life, I know she was. Yeah, she was a thaw and she had yeah. abortions and stuff and all that stuff. Yeah, in, I don't, I don't condone that, obviously, but like. But it's, it's yeah. almost, she, to me, Frida Kahlo, she's almost done as dirty as Klimt in the sense that her work is endlessly sort of reproduced and reappropriated yeah. and stripped, yes. of, stripped of its own cultural moment in the sense it's, that it's, it's now It's divorced kind of, from its world. Now it's yeah. become a poster card, the it's way a, that like Monet's later work has. Yeah. Right? So. But this is a poster card for sort of, you know, uh, I suppose you say bratty, queer, um, I want to be a lesbian today sort of femininity. Yes. It's like f there's literally... Um, I've seen this T-shirt that you can get. This T-shirt you could buy where Frida Kahlo is actually like um, edited to be an art hoe, where she's got like the cigarette, the yog carb. That's <laughs> <laughs> a total like, neoliberal neoliberal kitschification of uh, Frida, Frida Kahlo, which she she would despise. Yeah. Obviously, she would find that to be. Oh, revolting. she'd hate it because yeah. she she was in tune with a more like. I think even like Paglia talked a bit about this, although I don't think she has very much love for Frida. Um, this like she was in tune to like a much more primal, like Dionysian chaotic form of like Chthonic femininity yeah, yeah, in her. In, but uh, the result being her personal life was a disaster and her own yeah. body itself was a war zone of pain. Yeah, tremendous physical, physical out. pain. Yeah. But yeah, just to, just to touch on maybe our own philosophy of art and our own, um, you know, our yeah. own things that we're intending on doing. I think that there is there is stuff to you know there there is some stuff <laughs> there is some stuff to be kind of learned from this I suppose I think nowadays you do have to um, if you if you're being funded by uh, Yvonne Force whatever her name is and the Rockefeller with all with all the power of um, Lawrence S Rockefeller I think that that's yeah. when you probably know that you've you've definitely sold your soul to the devil. Um, yes. I think most people would probably like admit that. I think I think that there is like a real a genuine art scene and art community that is springing up around um, you know our circles, and obviously the, the having um, it's important to look at these things and to be aware of like what is going on in what you'd call the contemporary art world, and not just yeah. look at it as kind of like some you know. Yeah, you can look at it as like, you know, monkey throw poop spectacle where it's like, look at this fucking, you know. Sometimes literally poop. Yeah. Like it's, <laughs> yeah. And I know we've been we've been saying authentic this or inauthentic that a lot because this is something that I just kind of feel like there's no real rationale behind it to me. It's just like, I think that you're best to just trust your guts a lot of the time when it comes to this sort of thing. When you can tell when something's real and something's like, you know, not been overthought and overcooked in a sense where it's like not really a genuine kind of expression of anything. Um, exactly. And even when like, even just like the whole like analysis of it being like, that they're trying to normalize ugliness. It's, it's true, but even something that is genuinely ugly that's done in earnest can still deliver you into a transcendental state the way that the work of art can. Because it's it's like, I know what they mean by normalizing ugliness. They mean like trying to destroy the figure that these Greek busts represent mm. of like the largely like Indo-European white form of beauty. And they want to like complicate it with like, this is my African form of beauty, but it's like largely MFA grads in America that don't even know like what, 
um, an, an average, like, I mean, for example, in Nigeria, they have like a big fashion world. It's like, do they really yeah. know people actually find beautiful? A lot of it. I mean, if you go to Latin America, for instance, I mean, from their advertisements to their soap operas, the telenovelas, a lot of it, they're like people that look almost Europeanized, like heavily. I mean, I know like in Brazil, like my mother comes from Brazil and like the, the ruling class, they're like heavily, heavily Europeanized. Yeah, yeah, way. absolutely. Well, there's obviously yeah. that cast, casteism and sort of, you know, colorism in all these countries. But in terms of the actual like African, I mean, I'm just looking at this kind of wall of African masks here. And I think that they are really, really stunningly beautiful, a lot of them. like Oh, yeah. And African folk art and, you know, traditional African art is actually stylized in incredible ways. That, that yes, obviously this very is a, People like Picasso, obviously, he realized that, what the modernists were, you know, what his kind of milieu were trying to get at. Not talking about the early modernists like um, uh, Puvis de Chavannes or whatever, but no, 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 talking about that sort of primitivism kind of thing where we we want to kind of you know we want to get something that's like extracted from the real raw like essence of humanity. Yeah. They Art never, run, they like, never really got yeah. it. They ne they never actually, and I think Picasso himself admitted this later on that he never really captured anything that was that authentic and had that real raw sort of spirituality right. and real you know it, because it has it's it's not done because it's i suppose made not to be displayed in a museum these things are made to be uh in their you know in their real traditional form they are meant to be yes. put on and worn and um and basically ritualistic invoking yeah they they yeah. used to be invoking things exactly and it's not um for show these are really kind of obviously for, for in some cases they're for show unfortunately what happened was um because of tourism by europeans and then later by americans a lot of these like traditional folk cultures will basically make like cheap like mass-produced replicas mm. of their traditional garb for like tourists to buy trinkets of that's yeah. basically what it and is. i suppose a lot, you know, unfortunately someone like you and me we might find it a little bit hard to find uh something authentic versus something that's not because I mean big as himself you know he, he in terms of something that's um you know the actual statue of Zeus that he's used for this is obviously a 3d printed version um yeah and obviously the, the original statue of Zeus this was destroyed obviously and made by Phidias the uh, the very famous ancient uh, sculptor one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. But he's got a 3D printed uh, funny little plastic version of it, which he's used and <laughs> obviously blown up to giant scale for this. It's it's really just like taking the remains of what once great culture was and like just mashing it through this hyper real uh, extruder of culture. Th that's um, what I, that's what I was thinking as well. Is it is it are we even really capable nowadays of making something that is not just a pastiche of previous forms? Because right. there is that there is that obviously that pessimistic um, aspect of it. And I think do you, do you think maybe that is a better thing to simply remove yourself if you can from maybe getting too influenced by you know this this idea of finding things, collecting, uh, right, collecting aesthetics, and you know too focused on the stuff of the past. I don't know how how the modernists necessarily did it because you know. The Puvis de Chavania does interest me today as well a lot yeah. in terms of his, the way that he, um, I suppose he, he. I've been reading a little bit about him, like in terms of the way his paintings were received, they they were looked at as kind of uh, very flat and unfinished at the time. He kind of assumed yes. the the modelling and the very um, kind of. I don't know, well, well academicized forms of painting. And he did something that Highly was a lot more stark. Yeah. He did something that was, that was a lot more stark and a lot more kind of, um, but the, but that's at the same time, he wanted to get back to something that was maybe more, more primal or more, um, an older tradition of painting too. Yeah. That was, that, that was embodied, like even in sculpture and, and, uh, very like ancient world type of, um, sentiments within art but um, I, I think yeah. if we're if we're going to make something that is authentic like your uh prints for example i think that they have a tremendous kind of realness oh. to them, definitely I, I think that they're some of the best stuff that you've done absolutely and i think oh that wow you've got to continue doing those prints oh i will yeah because that's I mean, that's definitely one of your strongest mediums but i i think because like another thing too is like because my grandfather was a finished carpenter so I feel like working with wood is just a natural medium for mm. me. 
in a lot of ways. It's that cross um, craftsmanship thing, like because with woodcut, I suppose it is. It's one of the oldest materials in the world. Obviously, we make many yes. things out of wood since since we made you know invented a stick or well, it's, whatever. It's the oldest form of print making in the world as well. Yeah. So that's, um, and so, I, I think like even like what you do, like even in the digital space, I think like that's you're trying to like reconcile something um, with traditional media that you've done for years. And, and now you're like coming to terms with the fact that these tools can give you a, a great, greater ability to express a contemporary moment. Like you've done a lot of like portraits of like mythologizing, like figures around meme culture or like dissident political figure actors. And yeah. I thought that was like, cause I did, I, I recently did this. So recently I did do that, uh, Venus picture of Zoe Quinn. I think that was that I, I, a lot of people passed over that picture. Didn't really think much of it, but I wanted to go a bit beyond simply like taking, you know, a portrait of someone or taking just a picture of someone because these things age like really badly. I discovered this after doing like, you know, four years of, um, doing portraits and figures and internet internet figures a lot of the ones that age really badly were ones that were just kind of like a cultural moment that passed and didn't have yeah. any weight any weight behind it um and you know that but if you take it out of its um i suppose if you've got to kind of um you've got to put it into something eternal you've got to just use something that's transient and put it into something that's uh. more of a uh, i suppose because figures like that, I suppose it is an art trope. I suppose to have like Venus or something, but you yeah. got to think about it in terms of what is what does that really mean in the twenty first century? Like what is? Because I thought it was very the e girl, the amusing, like making making Zoe Quinn into the literal goddess of love. And um, to me, there's something quite beautiful about it. I don't know what it is. It's like maybe there's a kind of redemptive aspect to it. Um, I think you're trying to see um, her embedded within a greater whole that maybe either isn't there or it's contextualized by like all of the bullshit that happened with Gamergate. Yeah, yeah. So. Cause we're not going to remember that, but, but Zoe Quinn to me is more like, it has a more like a sexual aspect to it because Zoe, yeah, Quinn, Zoe Quinn's known for being like a sexual person. And I think that's kind yes. of like, obviously Which I don't, is kind I don't, of weird <laughs> when you actually look at it, but like, I don't know anything about like Zoe Quinn at all. Like I've never met her, never talked to her, but I, all I know is her like in this terms of like this icon form. Uh, which, the, she is the Helen of Troy of the internet. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah. that's, that's exactly it. And I think that long, long after that whole thing's forgotten or whatever, I still want to have, like a picture where she is immortalizing the picture um and it's not really necessarily even it, it doesn't even become about her at this point because if you look at someone like you know you look at sanford biggers's work it yeah you're, you're going to look back on this work and you think this is this is all about sanford biggers it's all it's, it's all about sanford biggers it's all his ego basically um which is which is a very like modern thing compared to how like history like remembers the artwork instead of the artist which is really funny how like nowadays you remember the artist rather than the artwork. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's bad. I, I, I don't want to it's be remembered. Terrible. I want the pictures I do to be remembered, and I don't even like I, films. Like, like you don't even remember the character. Like you do kind of, but like no, you remember the actors in the films yeah. more than the characters. It's like okay, yeah, uh, De Niro's character in Goodfellas. Yeah, it's like De Niro's character. You know what I mean? Like that's. Which is really odd and crazy because even like and it's like you can't separate moments. like you you can't like separate like you know the people who play the Avengers from like the actual Avengers the characters themselves yeah I, I exactly. think that, that that's again that's immortalized kind of embedded in like a celebrity a cult of celebrity as well but I mean I don't I don't think because but these people like Zoe Quinn or whatever they they have like a very niche form of celebrity but you can blow it up to a sense where it's like you're literally taking like a minor, incredibly minor figure who maybe had an outsized cultural impact when you think about it, but for a relatively short period, but of time, them yeah. themselves is this kind of like, you know, is really just kind of a nobody and I'm a nobody, but having this picture where you combine these things and you have yeah. something that speaks to something that is eternal, you know, in a way, because there's the idea of like, you know, love. I think you've got to have big concepts in work nowadays. You've got to have things like love. You've got to have things like, um, you know, maybe despair and hopelessness. A lot of the, a lot of things as well, where it's like a lot of things that people consider cringe. Yeah, people, yeah, exactly. People big, think big genuine strokes. emotions cringe. Yeah, yeah. You can't have it be self, you know, too self-referential, too ironic, whatever. And I feel like recently, you know, a lot of my work maybe it's a bit too stark, doesn't have like enough kind of going on. But maybe I'm a bit too afraid to like add in um, 
the, because I, I want to kind of, I'm always very cautious. I always kind of like walk in quite cautiously from a big idea and then I kind of step it back and then try and add in things as it progresses yeah, it, iter too, yeah. iteratively. I'm not like a maximalist. I'm, I'm a maximalist in my head and then I'm a, I'm a kind of a minimalist when it actually comes out, which is, you know, is, is bad in some ways, but I think in some ways it avoids me making like a big boo-boo where I'm like, <laughs> you know, do something like that's incredibly embarrassing. Well, we're, we're the same in the sense of like, I'm influenced. Well, uh, no, I shouldn't say that. I'm also influenced by a lot of like other people you would consider minimal, like Edvard Monk. Uh, oh yeah, but, yeah, absolutely. But I'm like but influenced. Kath Kathy Colvitz as well. Kathy Colvitz is. Uh, yes, exactly. This huge yeah. when I see in your prints, definitely. Oh, like, like, even like, which is funny because I'm not that like in terms of like materiality and in terms of like the actual process I'm influenced by Ukiyo paint, uh, prints, but in terms of like the actual artwork themselves, like I don't have a particular like attachment. I have more of like a, an attachment um, to a lot of like the Chinese, like literati painters like Seshu, but like, I don't um, have a, like a particular like fetishism over that. But when it comes to like woodcuts, yeah, Kathy Kowitz is like the, like to me is like my most, the, the biggest influence in terms of how, I think through subject matter, especially in our contemporary moment. Mm. But what I was going to say is that I, like my initial influences from an earlier age, ages um, in terms of like my own, like artistic development have been like total maximalists in terms of like visionary painters, even like Mark Toby, um, people like Venosa, uh, people, like artists that I would consider like having everything going to the point of being like, their own like <laughs> micro cults onto themselves. Yeah, like, even yeah. to an extent, Nikolai Rorish. Like, yeah, Nic Nicholas Rorish, definitely. I mean, no, I, like my own personal artwork isn't that like, I, I don't think is that like cluttered compared to like Alex Great. Like, I don't have this, like, well, first of all, I don't have the same skill, obviously, but like, <laughs> I don't. Um, but in some ways, I, I think Alex Gray. It, it can it can become a bit too opulent, a bit too over. It's just a bit too like kind of fussed over, I suppose. Where it's like everything has to be super, super maximal and like crazy. I mean, you, yeah, I don't fuss over my work. Like I don't like, for example, like a lot of artists like that destroy their works that they don't like or paint over them. Like I've never. <laughs> I like try to see it through to the end. Yeah, yeah. Which well, is kind of stupid. No, I think it's stupid at all. I think it's good to move on to you know a new thing or whatever. I often yeah. put down a work for a long time and then make a new version yeah. of it later on because I feel like I run up against a lot of blocks of um, vision. Vision is not able to be uh, pulled off, whatever. But having, I think, a long term. I always say this, you know, having some something of a long term like view of things where you don't just have to, you know, present something straight away. You can yeah. like, you because. Know, I think we forget a lot of the time that like real big masterpieces, they took like years to make. I mean, yeah, even, they San took. <laughs> even yeah. Sanford, Sanford Biggers's grotesque um, black child sitting in a chair, you know, that, that took 10 years to make because he had to, yeah. he had to corral. Um, Where it would take one the graffiti Rockefeller artist foundation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he had to corral the Rockefeller foundation one, for like, 10 years. It would take like one like prolific bomber to like do a piece like with the cartoonish blackface and like not even like an hour or two at nighttime given the cops don't come by and harass him so that's <laughs> well it's, it's it's no mean feat to get something that's uh, you know fifteen thousand pounds of bronze uh, so. yeah like even just like using bronze is like a in some ways a jerk off because oh god because that, <laughs> that is the the expense that must have been spent yeah. on casting that i wonder if the construction workers um i wonder if they actually like looked at the work of art and they, they Probably like, had a joke around the office, like a, a joke around like the uh, the time the the punch card, you know, machine, uh, the water cooler. When they like probably went to McDonald's after the like during lunch break, they were probably like chopping it up, like oh look how ugly this thing is. Yeah, <laughs> like, no, absolutely. I'm, I'm sure that there were many jokes had by the construction yeah, company. By the big, construction workers. Expense, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> But then, I mean, he's... If he's Biggers was probably there and, like, they had to, like, hide the fact they were, like, laughing, like, oh, my God, look at this fucking thing. We got him stuck. <laughs> he's so ensconced in his ivory tower, though, Mr. Biggers. I don't think he, he would care what the construction company would say about his... Uh, yeah, because the construction guys, they went off to coffee time and they, he went to Starbucks, so it's like, yeah. yeah. But, I mean... You just imagine that day that they installed this, the construction workers laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm Union 4228. It's like, uh, I got a contract to install this thing. <laughs> <laughs>
it, it is true. Like you, you always you always strive to achieve a, a vision. Um, like there's there's pictures that I've wanted to do paintings with, and and now with prints on that like literally I've thought about for a few years or like more than that. Mm. And I'm like, well, I wasn't at the, the skill level. Yeah. Well, like, the, the, the genesis, level to the do. genesis of these things definitely does take time. I think, yeah. I think that like, we got to just believe in our own ability to, to iteratively get, but that's like the Japanese kind of philosophy on improving anything. Yes. Just, just small, yeah. small steps every day and just keep Even, gathering people, you know, get, cause there's, I think there's a lot more like-minded people who are not, you know, ideologically bent about this sort of thing. Like terminally irony or terminally or terminally, irony, yeah, poison, terminally yeah. irony poison. And then, you know, like there's, there's people I meet on Twitter nearly every day now, there's someone new yeah. who's kind of like, you know, in um, the same headspace, they're just interested in doing creative, you know, creative projects and it's music, it's art, it's, you know, uh, writing or whatever. It would be nice if we could all fuse it, fuse it together in, in ways that were interesting um, in the future. Well, I think we so, could wrap. I think we could wrap up here. Honestly, there's lots of yeah. We've totally things, destroyed Biggins. <laughs> Biggins. Biggins. <laughs> we've totally destroyed Biggers. I mean, we've yeah. well, we, I, we've uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I I don't know, man. I, again, this is another piece that I think that the reaction to it was a lot more interesting in some ways than the, the actual, actual piece. piece than the actual piece itself. Now that now that we've actually gone over it, there wasn't actually as much. I mean, I I personally kind of enjoyed. Maybe even because I got to saw I got to see the awful Kara Walker piece in real life as well. But it's again another just just my general like you know purely like intuitive feeling, not based on any kind of like you know academicism or any kind of rationalization. It's just these these pieces just kind of ring very hollow to me. Um, yeah. When you get down to it, you actually do you know look into all the artist inspirations, all the motivations. Maybe it's because I'm not like a fucking you know jive black man or something, and maybe I don't have the funk to like appreciate this piece of art but i don't think that people who do have the funk even but, but give a people, shit about this at all but like high <laughs> but like even like highly cultured black people that like go to jazz clubs and they're in like various um like these like scenes that are largely related to music like yeah i mean i don't techno, think they'll look, 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 look at this yeah, look, they'll look like, at techno wow. guys remember like someone like jeff mills for example jeff mills or like carl yeah. craig one of these like big techno guys from detroit like i don't think that yeah. they, they have far more refined like taste like actual like afrofuturist like yes vision of art than any of this uh, you know like, like and don't get me wrong there's some other people like that one particular G dj who i'm not going to name names uh because he's a fucking ghoul but uh <laughs> that that like are like basically capitalizing on wokeness to like further their career their shameless careerism but there is like I, but that's like a relatively recent thing there are like people that genuinely came up from these underground um art and music scenes that are largely related to african american culture i think that they would look at this and maybe they would be somewhat interested like i can't like know the hearts and minds of the average person yeah, but yeah. the average like i i know for a fact the average black person in New York would probably like look at this and like, wow, this is kind of silly. Like it's yeah. not, um, I mean, how long it's, is this piece meant to be there for? Is this permanent? Till fixture? June, till June. Yeah. Yeah. So I think till June, yeah. when it, when it's removed, what, you know, is this going to sit in a warehouse somewhere? Is this, I don't know. Is this another case I'm of Carl Walker's, probably... Walker's fountain thing where it's just kind of like, you know, it causes a bit of a, a, a hoo-ha for a month or so. And then yeah. it, it just gets shuttled away into, you know, and gets gets people, wheeled out for a retrospective or something every now and again. Yeah, people are going, to, hopefully like we have enough content here in terms of like art history and our own insights to like make people listen to this episode of Style Talks. But I think like by the time the summer comes around, by the time White Boy Summer comes around, no one's going to remember. Oh, yeah, this, absolutely. So. Well, it, it will be remembered yeah. as maybe just another kind of, you know, uh, and another boil on the ass of uh, the contemporary art world, I suppose. Yeah, pretty um, much. I hate to say it. Yeah, just, yeah. Till like the summer comes by and like there's a, like I don't know. I mean, let's face it, it's America. So till there's like another riot that comes on. Yeah, but anything over like another <laughs> shooting. Anything, and then you'll anything, have like yeah. you'll have like uh, Kenda Wiley like coming out with like a like a brutal like uh, Biskinsky inspired painting that a bunch of like Chinese students have done. Of, of like some like mutilated black person being shot by a racist yeah, pig. More, more ambulance a literal chasing, pig. More, more ambulance chasing ghoulish kind of art, I suppose. I suppose yeah, that's like a literal a literal pig, but it's like a white pig. It'll be like the the crumb, <laughs> like Fritz the cat, like the pigs will be the cops. So be like, 
<laughs> yeah, I, th- I think th- you're definitely right that we can expect very much more in this vein. This art, this art is not going away anytime soon. It's probably going oh, to no. get bigger. It's going to get bigger and more lurid and more more grotesque and more and and as people more ultra violent. And as people, I suppose, get inured to it as well. It, I think the methods and the means they use to make it are going to have to get more extreme. Um, yeah. And you know, maybe one day someone's going to vandalize one of these statues or destroy this exhibit or something. Oh, and, and that, that will be, cause that, that that'll be the cause. thing that they 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 love that more than that anything will, else. There'll the be like a whole. There'll be like like six months worth of Frieza articles. Yeah. On like yeah. art vandalism against port like uh against by POCs. <laughs> so the last like, thing I want to say is please nobody yeah. nobody go and do uh, any kind of don't do a Tim McVeigh on this uh, statue of this thing, please. Uh, yeah, don't leave. Don't uh, yeah. Don't. <laughs> Don't do a. F- we don't. we do not condone literally <laughs> any. This is not even ironic. Please. This is not even non wink. Please do not do anything to this this statue. No, seriously, please don't. Because don't that only condone. gives these bastards attention, and that's the last. Exactly. Thing, right? We don't condone like McVeighing the statue. This <laughs> is not gonna. It's not gonna help anyone. I predict. Okay, here's the thing. Last word. I predict, and don't hold me on this, but mm. this is probably going to happen. There will be a Jesse Smollett art world incident where you will have a like woke statue of like a sugar mama like a, a mammy yes and then the, the artists themselves are going to vandalize <laughs> yes. it and then yes. it's going to be like the new like the city of new york is going to waste like tens of thousands like millions of dollars in a police investigation yeah, trying to figure out who vandalized this famous piece of yeah. and, and they'll have like literally a mask like a masked figure that they turns out Will be the artists themselves that are going to vandalize, yeah. and then they'll claim, they're going to like then, paint then, a poorly drawn swastika on yeah. it, and or then something. after the fact they'll claim that this was all part of the artwork itself, and it was designed to challenge people's yes. uh, perceptions yeah. or whatever. Anyway, I think yeah. we, I think I think we plumbed the depths of this. Uh, this I think we totally canceled ourselves once again. Gargantuan <laughs> yeah. mon- monstrous monument again, and we'll see you next time. Anyway, but God bless and goodbye. God bless. Farewell, everybody. <laughs>